are some technical issues. We need to add some rights to the different speakers. So they can't speak and they can't share their camera. So let's wait for IGF6 to do the necessary stuff. Hello, Reina. Always smiling. <laughs> hey, everyone. Can you hear me, Sammy? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Luca, are you able to share your camera, Lucien uh, and Jean-Jacques? Yes, yeah. I am. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Wonderful. Good morning to everyone again. Perfect. Can you, can you see me as well and uh, Amy? Correctly. Yes, but loud it, and clear. Jean Jacques, are you here? Because I. Uh, He told me that he's online, but, uh, but uh, we don't see him, to see him. But uh, worst case, what we can do as uh, we have people waiting, we can start the workshop and Jean-Jacques can join us uh, like uh, during the presentations. So uh, if you're okay, Lucien, we can start. Perfectly, yeah, yeah. Jean-Jacques will be uh, uh, joining us, I guess, uh, during the during the workshop, and uh, well, might have a time zone problem. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so, indeed, we can start. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this session on security meets responsibility, uh, connected everything resilience. Um, as you know, I am Lucien Castex. I'm the representative for public policy uh, at AFNIC, the French CCTLD. And I will be moderating the session with Sami Suissi from ANSI, the French Cybersecurity Agency. Um, I invite uh, the virtual participant to ask que questions directly on the chat and Zoom. We'll ha also have a Q&A session after the panel discussion. Uh, it's quite important to be really interactive for such a session. Um, our topic today is the IoT, the Internet of Things, security and resilience, which is, let's be honest, 
quite uh, a broad topic. IoT has expanded substantially and no day connected the multiple uh, diversity of objects surrounding us is both a technology challenge and a political challenge as well, um, from the smart home to the smart city. Um, the actual COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the essential role of the internet in our daily lives. Despite the noticeable increase in traffic that happened during the first lockdown last year, network of <coughs> sorry, networks have held up and the internet has proved to be re resilient. Nevertheless, digital products and digital services continue to evolve and expand to create the connected everything. Building trust is as important as building new infrastructures. With the emergence of new technologies, there is a switch in paradigms and a need for more comprehensive understanding of resilience, security, and sovereignty. So in this context, like governments are promoting new legislation affecting the internet worldwide. Like if we take the European Union, for example, we have more legislative packages that have been introduced, like the Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act, Cyber Resilience Act, as well as the revision of uh, NIST directive. And if we take, oh, for example, also the United States, we have the uh, NIST uh, IoT specific guidance, the Internet of Things Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020, and they have a major impact on manufacturing of those IoT devices. So cybersecurity and resilience of the IT ecosystem has been para uh, of paramount importance, and we are witnessing a drive toward data protection and the uh, security meet responsibility in order to foster a trusted IoT ecosystem from cybersecurity design to human rights per default. And in order to identify the issues and the challenges facing us, we are pleased to have today in our panel uh, three renowned experts from different backgrounds that uh, will provide us with uh, very interesting insights, and I'm very sure. And we're happy to have those VIPs with us. We have uh, Luca Belli, uh, PhD, who is a professor of internet governance and regulation at FGV Law School, where he directs the Center for Technology and Security and the CyberBricks project. Luca is also associated researcher at the Centre de droit public comparé of Paris 2 uh, University and editor of International Data Privacy Law Journal that is published by Oxford uh, University Press. He is currently a member of the board of the Alliance for Affordable Internet and the director of the Latin American edition for the Computers, Privacy and Data Protection Conference. Then we have uh, Reina Stamboliska, uh, who is the founder and CEO of RS Strategies, the advisory that nurtures entrepreneurs and SMEs with actionable expertise to help them navigate uncertainty. She focuses on EU digital diplomacy and resilience through cybersecurity, hybrid threats, strate strategic auto autonomy, and data protection. She's also an award-winning author for La Face Cachée d'Internet, uh, published in 2017. Reina uh, also uh, statutorily supports open source data and science. She has consulted for international organizations, uh, private companies, and nonprofit. Energetic and passionate, she is recognized as an international speaker, and that's why we're happy to have her with us today. And uh, last, we'll have uh, Jean-Jacques Sahel. I hope that he is with us now. I don't know yet. We have to check. But uh, Jean-Jacques is uh, head of access uh, to information policy of Asia Pacific at Google uh, since 2019, uh, overseeing Google public policy approach in the region for issues including misinformation, communication policy, and intermediary liability. And before joining Google, Jean-Jacques was managing director of ICANN uh, Europe and led organization corporate strategy and operation across the European region. So uh, if uh, we start with our uh, different presentation, uh, let's uh, start with uh, Luca Belli. Uh, the name of our uh, work, uh, town hall is Security Meet Responsibilities. And you lately published uh, like a paper on uh, uh, responsible IoT. 
so uh, my question for you is how can IoT impact fundamental rights and how can tech businesses do better fulfilling their responsibilities to respect human rights? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sami and Lucien and all the friends that have organized this very timely and important discussion. Uh, as, I, as Sami was mentioning, actually, I, my presentation will be based mainly on this paper that I published a couple of years ago, but is still very, uh, very relevant. Sadly, I would say, because not too much has been evolving over the past couple of years. And uh, the name of the paper was the need for a riot, where riot was the acronym of responsible uh, internet of things and so my presentation is based on this framework and then i would provide a couple of examples from a group of countries that i analyze a lot the BRICS countries of brazil russia india china and south africa on which we have developed a lot of recent research at cts here in in brazil so uh, there are three points that i actually i would like to highlight here today and first that we need to focus on what uh, the doctrine defines complex IoT environments. So the integration systems that integrate many devices, connected devices, through platforms that are, uh, automate these devices and chain functionally the devices to provide some sort of smart applications. Uh, and this is usually powered uh, through AI systems and can feed into uh, big data analytics. And so depending on the size, here we can have smart homes, smart buildings, smart factory, smart cities, smart grids. Really, it's really, it may be enormous as a size, this kind of, of systems. And uh, this leads to the second point that I will analyze, which is uh, we have to focus with this expansion of size, there is also an expansion, of course, in the attack surface of these systems. And this means that there are both risks and responsibility for the actors that are behind these systems, but also for duties for the state that have to uh, a duty to provide for human rights. And so the, my final point will be uh, a couple of suggestions on how uh, uh, public and private actors can fulfill their duty to provide uh, for uh, fundamental rights in the case of the public actors and their responsibility to respect human rights in, in uh, terms of the business sector, especially with regard, well, not only to regard to privacy and security, but also to regard to a host of other rights that may be compromised by uh, this system when they are not properly designed and implemented. So uh, when we speak about IoT, as in the first speaker, maybe it's good also to, 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 to stress that uh, it is, they are, particularly relevant as systems or of connected devices, maybe millions of connected devices with embedded sensors, because they, they, are, in, they are based on the increasingly fine-grained, uh, ubiquitous, uh, and very voluminous, uh, very large volumes of data uh, that can be collected and processed. And this, this collection, this processing enhances efficiencies in your home, in your grid, in your uh, city. Uh, and so on the one hand, the big data and AI systems that power these systems uh, are essential. They are instrumental enablers to realize the full potential of the IoT. But on the other hand, the, this is complementary, is the IoT is essential to an instrumental to realize the potential of AI and big data feeding the systems with uh, data that may be personal data or non-personal data, right? So this bidirectional uh, uh, relation is really essential because uh, we typically focus on the things, on the connected object. But we should actually see the IoT as a collection of technologies that expands the reach of the internet, the reach of AI into the physical world. And that is my, here, here we enter in my second consideration that is not only about privacy and surveillance. It's really, uh, the IoT blurs the distinction between online and offline. Uh, and also this ex enormously expands the, the uh, potential of risks. So if we want to consider this from a philosophical perspective, uh, Oxford University philosopher Luciano Freudi would call this the situation uh, of on life paradigm. So when we, uh, merge on, online and offline. But from a very pragmatic perspective, especially a, a cybersecurity perspective, this really demands us to rethink completely security. Uh, I mean, the, the past uh, 
eight years of uh, uh, attacks, of Russian attacks to Ukraine, provided us a lot of examples of how IoT systems can not only be hacked, they can really be weaponized to wreak havoc in a country. Uh, we have a large uh, uh, spectrum, for example, uh, going from the sabotage of, of the uh, Ukrainian greed in 2015 and 16, the NotPetya malware attack that paralyzed the banking system of the country in 2017, and even disabled some uh, radiation monitoring systems at Chernobyl, which really makes us understand the, the, the kind of risks that we are facing, right? Uh, so it is essential that we embed cybersecurity as a core preoccupation when we design the system, when we implement the system. Otherwise, we are not building smart systems. We are building time bombs. And I'm sorry to be so bland and maybe look a little bit pessimistic, but I think that the past decade of example really corroborate what I'm, I'm mentioning now. And so the, uh, here brings us to my last consideration, which is the state, the public bodies have a duty to provide for security, privacy, uh, and freedom of association, freedom of movement, and all these rights can be impacted by when IoT systems do not function properly and are not secured. And corporations, of course, have a responsibility to fulfill those rights, but also they need guidance somehow to do this. And this is why I think multi-stakeholder partnerships here are not only something desirable, are really something essential for the implementation of proper cybersecurity. We have, if we have well-designed normative frameworks, that is really the, the cornerstone that states should provide in order to achieve system resilience to avoid, sorry, to, to, to uh, avoid attacks, to uh, uh, define clear obligations, to have an obligations also periodic audits to see if the strategies and systems that are utilized are still uh, cyber secure. Because what is cyber secure today may be vulnerable tomorrow or in one month. So it is essential to periodically assess to provide confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information, but also to provide data privacy and data security. So legal frameworks are, the essential, are essential, but as a lawyer myself, I can really tell you very honestly that legal frameworks are only the basis. It's, they are necessary, but not sufficient. The main challenge is to achieve, to achieve cooperation and, and implementation. And let me provide you a couple of examples to, to finalize this. One for, from Brazil, where there is a, a very nice uh, general data protection law adopted in 2018, entered in force 2020, that very much mirrors the EU GDPR, which includes an, an obligation, not only a principle in Article 6, but an obligation uh, of data security by design, Article 47 40, uh, and 46 of the, the law. But so one may say, fantastic, Brazil has data security. There is a, now, a new authority, there is a new law, but actually the authority has never specified how this obligation has to be concretely implemented by technologies, by developers, by entities. So most data, data systems in Brazil are extraordinarily insecure because there is no guidance on how to do this. And so people, any kind of entity is basically in the dark because they don't know how to comply with the law. And so here I would like to provide another counter example with, to finalize about China, which is uh, um, absolutely criticizable for many things. But they are, in my view, the, the only country that has always considered cybersecurity really seriously and strategically. Since 2014, they created what they call a shitong, so a body, a systems of public entities that coordinate to, uh, pro, to, to uh, strategize on how to implement informatization, but at the same time, also cybersecurity. So digitalization and cybersecurity are two sides of the same coin, and this is how they should be seen. And the, another very important point that they that I think should be considered from the Chinese system is that they do not consider the normative framework as the, the key, the solution, but only a, a basis on which the other vectors of regulation have to be built. And it is something very uh, uh, visible for those who work with theory of regulation. Law is a very imperfect uh, instrument of regulation. You have to couple it with investments, which direct how the technology will be built. So if you want cyber secure technology, four billions in the development of that secure on, the, on that technology. And on the other hand, you also have to translate the normative frameworks into technical specification for developers. And that is some, what a lot of 
uh, uh, think tank, public think tanks in China do translate norms into specifications, technical standards that can be understood by the developers. Otherwise, compliance is impossible. So thank you very much. Uh, and sorry if I was, was speaking too much. I hope that I was stick in the, the 10 minutes I had and I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. You, you were perfect. Um, that's quite a topic indeed uh, when you speak about human rights by design, privacy by design, security by design. It's quite a number of reflections from the EU on that tech. It's a Europe use case on Brazil is quite uh, is quite interesting and low is quite an imperfect instrument indeed. I would like to to give the floor to Raina Stambuliska. Uh, now, legislation, uh, Raina, is increasingly present in the realm of the Internet of Things. A wide range of guidelines, as Lucas said, best practices, legislative proposals exist throughout the world that can help improve the security of connected products and services. What are your reflections on that, Raina? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be back to IGF again. Um, so there are different aspects to consider here when we talk about norms in general. Legislation is one of those norms. Um, one word about why I'm interested in this is uh, to also kind of build upon um, what Luca was just saying, is that we need rules to live together as a society. But if part of the people, a big part of the people do not understand th those rules, we cannot live you know, normally and healthily as a society. Um, and so this has been, um, if you like, a way for me uh, and a motivation for for my work is to bridge that gap of sorts and you know kind of translate into human language uh, what lawyers say on one side or legislators or policymakers and what technical people say on the other side because that's you know with technical people that's the other way around we are so drowning in in slang you know in technical slang that people cannot understand what exactly the whole thing is about um so without you know repeating what luca was saying as a definition of iot i would like to offer a complementary um in a way reframing of this definition which binds directly to um to what i just said which is iot is an ecosystem and it's basically two types of ecosystems. One is an ecosystem of technical and technological items. You have the object itself, right? Um, and that object connects with different, well, types of protocols, you know, um, different connections to distant services. Um, you have the data that transits through those connections that is stored and, you know, um, uh, treated to produce different services, whatnot, be it through machine learning or through simple, let's say, algorithms. Uh, I mean, you know, ordering um, uh, in a chat, time stamping messages, that's an algorithm, right? It's not AI, but it's still an algorithm. So that's one um, ecosystem of technological yeah, items that interact together. And for those items, we'll, we'll get back to this afterwards, but we are very far from making it exactly clear to anyone, to 100% of the population, um, what those items are, how they interact together, uh, what is being done to uh, guarantee those can be trusted and that their interactions can be trusted as well, right? The, the other type of ecosystem in IoT is is the the users ecosystem. You know, if we like here we are how many like say we are five people on stage. If each and every one of us um, is asked what IoT do you have, you know, for for you, 
uh, there will be at least five different IOTs being cited. So it can be consumer electronics, it can be industrial IOT, um, it can be home appliances, it can be, uh, you know, that sort of things. But there is something that is neither um, an industrial IOT nor a consumer electronics per se um, um, object, which is the increasing and like vastly increasing uh, amount of wearables, things that have sensors and that we wear. Um, and that can fall into the health monitoring uh, realm of stuff if you like, which are not necessarily medical devices per se, um, and for which there so far is very little um, legal, let's say, um, framework and guidance. Um, because, well, they are not medical devices per se, so they're not, not certified as such. But on the other hand, they're kind of consumer electronics, but they deal with, well, sensitive data, because health data is sensitive data. Um, and as a reminder, what sensitive data is, uh, GDPR, for example, uh, at, on Article 9 defines sensitive data as anything that relates, as any personal data that relates to, um, well, political opinions, religious uh, obediences, uh, but also to uh, the self, my biometric data, for example, DNA and so on. Um, so we are left basically with a situation where those two very complex ecosystems collide. Um, and at some point, we are having our discussions about how can we make those ecosystems trustworthy before they become trusted, <laughs> uh, and how they can be resilient. Uh, and we are asking that question uh, quite often through the angle of um, of, let's say, legislation, audits, and things like this. And what I'm, the blind spots I'm seeing is that we are on one side having big troubles um, communicating all those efforts to the, well, 99.9999% of the population who is not you and me, um, meaning we don't have any labels, we don't have any meaningful, accessible, simple, not simplistic, way of conveying all those uh, efforts that we're doing. Uh, and on the other side, we are still struggling with specific aspects of um, technology and um, organization of security, which um, one of those that for me is um, essential and that basically crystallizes everything that's not right or that's not done right is vulnerability management and this is a very huge um yeah problem uh and a very huge remit for iot uh in the sense that it um it concerns vulnerabilities concern not just the software components but also the hardware components and all the intermediaries there and so if, if it is relatively simple to ship um, updates and patches and fixes for software components, um, it is not at all that simple to do so for hardware components, for microcode and that sort of things. And this becomes a particular pain when we look at medical devices, for example, or industrial IoT, meaning those are all connected systems, connected ecosystems that are vital infrastructure or critical or provide critical service to their users. And so we have those issues here for which um, legislation is necessary, but it is a base, you know, it is a baseline. It's a starting point. Then for us to have responsibility in those ecosystems, for me, responsibility is not enough. Responsibility means little without accountability. How do I, you know, the law says I'll get sanctioned and so on and so forth, but how do I actually implement um, the law and hold, well, manufacturers, vendors and so on to account? This to me is a very different, again, um, question that's for the time being. We're 
kind of you know dancing around in legislation in diff different legislative pieces uh, but we are yet to um, get to you know hold of and, and, and grasp um, especially when it boils down to well vulnerability management uh, and getting users basically to be able to exercise um, well, there are fundamental rights, for example, you know, in freedoms. Uh, GDPR is an embodiment in ho of how to exercise your fundamental right to privacy. Um, however, we do not have um, the equivalent in terms of, for example, security. So where I'm going with this is how can we, as a global society, as a global community, um, move forward not just with responsibility but also uh, with accountability especially when it touches down to non-state actors because you know states of course they need and they have procedures to make rules that well are at least theoretically participative and it's their uh, obligation to protect fundamental rights and freedoms but more and more uh, we also have the, the, the trend where for innovation to happen, it always happens outside of the rule of, the, uh, of law. Uh, I'm not talking about constitution or things like this, even though that also some, sometimes happen, uh, happens, but I'm talking about uh, fundamentals such as GDPR, for example, but not only that. So how do we get those people, and this is, an open question because uh, you know I'm too young or too old depending on point of view to have answers to that fundamental type of questions um, that is a question for me and for all of us because that's something we need to tackle as a global community thank you I hope I didn't go beyond my time thank you very much Reina and uh, when welcome Jean-Jacques you joined us and you have all the right to share your screen and and your mic so uh, as the representative of uh, legal of uh, private sector and as you're working in google now uh, it would be interesting to have feedback from you because if i come back to what luca has said he said like legal base is necessary but not sufficient so uh, with the growing number of connected devices the technological combinations available today and the growing worry of a number of users about data governance and privacy and how do you perceive the need for this increased security and following the best practices implementation for both Google infrastructure in your case and more globally the internet e ecosystem. The floor is yours. Thank you very much Sami and um... Good afternoon and evening and or morning, depending on where you are. And it's very nice to see uh, many people I know actually on this screen. Um, and and thanks again, uh, this year and Sami for organizing this session. And it was great actually listening to to my fellow panelists because I think there's a lot of uh, of points that I, I'd like to touch on and perhaps to to expand on. And I think I might just pass on my my introduction about how important it is to have. Uh, to think about these questions, considering how much we're in, a, in, in, in such a highly interconnected age, right, where uh, our personal uh, lives, as well as our everyday at work, if you will, are uh, surrounded by by, connect, by connections and by increasingly by connected devices. So we really need to uh, to make this work. And obviously, it's happened all pretty fast, right? Um, arguably, um, so. You know, we need to address malicious actors, but also what might be just, uh, you know, the sort of uh, innocent uh, mispreparations and, and, and not enough uh, proper assessment of risk in these areas. And how do we do this? I think just to, to, to continue on from what I think Luca was saying, indeed, yeah, we do need legislation basic legislation, but it's not enough. What we really need is a holistic approach to the challenge. And so uh, the way we would look at it from a you know, just from the perspective of our, of our business, but I think it, it works quite well generally as a, as a wider, perhaps a public, public policy approach, is to have a multi-pronged approach where we look at at least 
four or five components. I'll give you five. Um, products, the wider ecosystem, the role of governments, businesses, and then people. People might be employees as well, right? So if you start with products, certainly the way we look at it for our own products is that every single product that we make is secure by default. We build in security as part of the development process and we try to make it secure by default. And we hope that as we see more and more connected devices, others across the value chains, across the supply chains are gonna have that same approach of security by default. Uh, I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm summarizing, of course, I could speak for, for, for a while just on that point, but I'll, let, let me continue to the next one. So it's products first, secure by default. Then thinking about a wider ecosystem, if we wanna create a safer internet, um, we need to have you know, responsible companies, but also responsible actors generally. There's a multitude of actors across the supply chain and the value chain. If we think about just one connected device, in many cases, not just one manufacturer, we're talking about several manufacturers with, that all have a part in this. And then you've got other components um, to make that product work for the end user that go you know, that includes, for instance, the connectivity part, you know, the, the, the telecom routing all the way to the end user. And it's that whole, we need to consider that value chain as a whole and make sure that that value chain, that supply chain is secure the whole way through. And then we need to think about, um, you know, I was touching on when, when I was talking about connectivity. <laughs> There's been some interesting cases over the years i think luca was referring to some of the the misuses the weaponization of some of the connected device uh, potentially or indeed in real life um and one of the things we need to think about is what is the, the the routing of the data okay so we need to make sure that we have resilient systems for the transport of the data as well we need resilient infrastructure uh, and infrastructure that itself is secure, but also diverse. We need to think about different types of technology for, for connectivity and for networks. And we need to make sure that there's diversity in the routing of the data. We wanna make sure that we have uh, good competition at the level of networks and, and the routing of data so that we don't have uh, too small a number of critical points of failure in how data uh, moves and therefore uh, a way for an easier way, if you will, for malicious actors to to um, to be successful. And so we do our bit, right? We invest massively as a company in infrastructure that supports the transport of data from things like submarine cables to data centers to caches, and all of these are built with security in mind. And so that's what we'd like to see in that sort of wider ecosystem, really across the whole journey of a product, but also a service from conception all the way to being used by the user, we need to have that continuity of security. If we think about businesses, generally, I mean, every business nowadays in the economy is at least is increasingly a digital business in some part, uh, whether it's just for its day-to-day -day operations or because it's getting online in some shape or form. And so it's fine. Every business should embrace new technologies and shouldn't be afraid, but we should build in knowledge uh, and, and an understanding of risk of cybersecurity uh, across the organization, uh, from the employee all the way to leadership. And the leadership of an organization today has to be a digitally minded leadership. In pretty much any role of leadership, there is a digital element and a risk element that needs to be taken into account. Part of that can be uh, done, should be done by adopting good practices. Um, so it can be about the adoption of um, security and data protection standards, such as some of the ISO standards out there. So that's that's a good tool, for instance, about how businesses uh, can uh, build in those those capabilities to be to be secure. Um, and and there is the link, to, and that's not just for those that are protecting. Let me be clearer. Perhaps this is not just for companies that are uh, manufacturing connected devices. We're talking about any business out there that is using connected devices and generally connected services. Um, and then it goes through those businesses, adopting those good practices, also thinking about their supply chain, their providers, making sure they have the right strong security capabilities themselves. So 
all across the supply chain again making sure we have an understanding of, of security then there's the role of government they themselves need of course to have their infrastructure protected and then how they interact with the public uh, that's pretty obvious and that goes through a whole range of uh, of elements and and here i think perhaps it's a good moment to think that it's it's not just cyber security in the uh, hardware sort of way we also need to think about uh, again people and safety in the broader sense so how malicious actors can can combine sometimes attacks on the hardware but also on the software on things like propaganda however how again there can be a continuum of attacks for the malicious actors and we as a society need to be prepared across that broader understanding of what safety means and the final one is people again as i was saying at the beginning it's it's about individuals but it's also simply employees or decision makers everyone needs to have a culture of cyber security increasingly um, and there are steps that can be taken right to protect oneself to protect our devices our online accounts um, that don't require that much time and a little cost uh, you know you can take security assessments, free security assessments that exist online, you can find them. We offer some um, enable multi-factor authentication, use password managers, uh, make sure you have updated operating systems for your devices so that you know old uh, faults uh, cannot be uh, exploited by, by malicious actors. Uh, enable extra security features on, on some of your online accounts, for instance, and generally just be vigilant, be, be aware about things like phishing or uh, social engineering attacks avoid clicking on unknown links. I think many of us on this call probably know about this, but the wider public, actually there's still a massive gap. And we, we as a society, again, should really invest. I think Luca was saying earlier, you know, cybersecurity costs hundreds of billions a year. Let's invest a little bit of that in user awareness raising. Uh, because, and to me, empowering users um, is, uh, is it is key to, to to mitigating these problems long term, right? We can churn out as much legislation as we want, uh, even technology. At the end of the day, a user that is aware and empowered is the key uh, to to all this. That that that's or at least a major part of mitigating the problem, because I think that's why I like to pick up on what what Luca was saying. So I think you know, yes, we do need legislation, but actually. And legislation is only part of that solution. We really do need to have a holistic approach with these other measures in mind. Um, that could be technology or that can be awareness raising. When we think about legislation, whether it's hate speech or poison pen letters or propaganda, you, you hear those terms, they might sound old fashioned. They're not new. Today we might call them trolling or we might call them disinformation. They're not new. We actually often have laws already. We, we've had product safety laws for a long time. But we do need to reinterpret them, perhaps reapply them in, in this new context to make it effective and combine them with other initiatives, other tools to ensure that we can have an overall effective approach to dealing with this problem. Um, so just to sum it up, I think it's, it's really that uh, embedding really that way of thinking, that culture of online security and safety that we all need to work on and to embed in our everyday lives and everyday work. So thank you. Thanks for, for listening. Uh, of course, plan, plenty more to discuss and, and, and happy to take questions. Thank you, Jean-Jacques, for this presentation and for the different insights. Uh, before starting the Q&A session, I just want to go back to the different panelists and see if you have any remarks, feedbacks on what the others have presented already. The floor is yours. Luca, uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Luca. Yeah, just a very quick comment on what uh, both uh, Raina and Jean Jacques were, was, were mentioning about uh, the question of incentives. I think that a very important point that we have to bear in mind is that most of the connected devices uh, are not developed by corporations that traditionally invest or know about software security or cyber security or digitalization in any how. Most of the consumers' electronics are developed by producers of toys or of, of any other uh, household appliance or cars that traditionally were producers of those goods, not of software. So 
they are totally unprepared. <laughs> and it's not really a question of bad faith, it's a question of lack of uh, means, even uh, I, I don't want to downgrade the consumers or of, of, uh, uh, producers of consumers' goods, but it's a, it's a matter of lack of know-how and intellectual capacity. People working there, they are not software engineers. Maybe they have hired a couple over the past months or the past years. And on the other hand, consumers don't really care about security. They care about cheap prices, nice design, nice features, but cybersecurity is really, I probably the last concern of consumers, and so that is why it, it's essential to have laws that create obligation to secure connected devices. But it's also essential to explain how to properly implement those laws and give incentives, financial incentives. You do well cybersecurity, you pay less taxes. You cr we create. Uh, bonuses for those who ex excel in cybersecurity, because otherwise the market itself, I, I, I'm very not convinced, will regulate with regard to the Internet of Things. The, of course, the cyber, uh, those enterprises that have been producing software, they know how to do it secure, or at least they can understand how to do it secure, and they have an incentive to do it secure. But the large majority of connected devices is not produced by those companies. Sorry, again, if I'm speaking too much. Raina, you wanted to intervene, go ahead. Yeah, just a, uh, well, a reaction to the reaction <laughs> to what Luca was saying. Um, let me nuance this. Uh, of course, I mean, like many manufacturers of now connected stuff are not um, originally, like traditionally uh, professionals of this, but who has been, I mean, you know, the internet is, has been here for what, 30 years. We were hardly born, me at least. Um, you know, but, but that's not the point. The point is we are nearly in 2023. So, you know, hiding all over again behind, oh, but I didn't know. That's not okay either, right? In the sense that um, it, when everyone was experimenting in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, it was okay to, um, you know, move forward, break fast, you know, uh, move uh, fast, break things, whatever, you know, light motif, um, big corporations can, can think of and so on and so forth. But in 2023, I mean, we are a month away, right? Um, this is starting to be largely unacceptable to hear people who have already, you know, who want to invade other markets who want to engage into digital transition or transformation of their products to diversify, to augment, you know, uh, revenues and so on and so forth by saying, oh, but well, we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll do quick and dirty just because we need money. And yeah, well, too bad if people don't care about this. This is not, you know, incentives go both ways. One way of incentives to go is to, if especially if we think in terms of policy, is to say, look, guys, uh, for those of you who accept that, you know, time to market can be slower, but because you want to protect yourself and the users, uh, will basically, you know, uh, give value back by, I don't know, uh, while well, decreasing, you know, taxes for a given period of time or whatever. But there must be, and I'm saying must and not should, there must be, you know, incentives and sanctions because, again, it's not acceptable for people, you know, like Barbie to name, you know, not to name them, but for, for Mattel, you know, and the Barbie who used to do a connected doll that was listening on kids and that allowed anyone to speak to kids, you know, from afar. I mean, those people, even though uh, technology is not their core um, expertise. It is not acceptable for people who have largely the budget to hire and to outsource the production of those tools to just not embed security into it. You know, like, again, uh, and, and people are like users are starting to be increasingly concerned about security just because we are hearing uh, about 
attacks, compromissions, breaches, and whatnot every day. And an increasing number of people have been targeted or being victims of those of those incidents. So they are um, concerned about this. The problem is that they do not have the means to impose this on the people they buy stuff from. And that's where we have this disequilibrium, you know, where basically people do want and they expect because when you go to the supermarket you don't expect to be buying stuff that's you know good and stuff that's past you know date of consumption right you go and you don't look at the date just because uh you are used to you know even though you have never read that law that the food that's in the supermarket it is good for you to buy and eat that's we do not have the equivalent of this for uh, for technology and that's where for me you know the problem is again not just that you can have you know startups who decide to test out things and so on and so forth it's the thing the problem that they do outside of um, of, of the of a way to uh for for everyone to see what they're doing and i'm not talking proprietary stuff here not talking ip you know intellectual property i'm talking well saying what you do and how you do it you know we have those scandals about food when are we going to have equivalent scandals about technology right that's that's where i kind of you know disagree with you when you say people don't care well they do they just don't know how to make their voices heard and again we as policymakers also struggle to give value to people who do good, right? I mean, how many cybersecurity marketing efforts have you seen re recently? How many companies who do have efforts to do cybersecurity and to do it right have an actual communication campaign to say, here is how we protect you? I could count two or three. Which is a shame, right? I mean, why aren't you <laughs> transforming those efforts for privacy and security into a unique selling point? And I saw Jean-Jacques Jean has a comment. Yeah, uh, we'll let the floor to Jean-Jacques. Also, uh, check the chat. We have a colleague asking us to reflect on the existing responsible cybersecurity practices or best practices worldwide. We answered a bit, but well, <laughs> Jean-Jacques, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh... I react on, on, on the last point, but also uh, just more widely. Uh, like we do uh, have ongoing campaigns for to, to, to help our users on safety and cybersecurity, both on our platforms, but also out there in the uh, in the physical world, if you will. Uh, just a couple of points on this one: uh, like 150,000 scholarships uh, has been given by Google for the, the Google Career Certificate for things like. Uh, IT support and data analytics. We go out there proactively. We organize online safety seminars, that sort of thing. And that's not just for students, although that's a large part, but you know, for educators, for companies, etc. And then we we help also with the propagation of standards. Then it goes to the points I was making about supply chains, where certainly for the products that we're involved with, we look at the entire supply chain. So it's not just about what we make ourselves. It's also all the people that work with us. And, and there's this concept that we have in cloud, which is zero trust. It means we cannot assume that we should trust any supplier or any particular equipment or service. We have to assume that there could be a flaw from anywhere. And so we have to be doubly careful. So we have to, to and, and so by, by trying to do that, we try to do it with a wider ecosystem and sort of to spread our practices. Then there's a number of efforts we do, you know, uh, sponsoring various communities like the open source community, uh, to try and, and, and do more awareness raising research into this, etc. So I think that there, there are efforts, but I would agree with you that there's just not enough. There should be much more uh, out there uh, talking to talking to the general public and helping them. It depends from country to country. Some countries are very good. I, I see, uh, I go sometimes on countries where I see ads about very, you know, basic sort of uh, cyber health uh, on buses. It's wonderful. You see that in in Singapore, for instance. You see the, the, the local regulator IMDA has got lots of cyber safety safety uh, advice everywhere. Uh, it's very visible. Uh, I, I I don't know if it works, but they try at least, right? 
Um, I know there's, there's a lot of phishing attempts, for instance, in Singapore. So there's a lot of advertising on that by the government. And that's great. I'd love to see that more. Um, I just want to mention that like, I think a number of, like, you know, there's, there's a discussion to be had with governments as well about what you were saying about, you know, how we look at, at uh, product safety. And, and my point about sort of thinking about what laws we already have, and perhaps it's it's reinterpreting the laws and, and thinking about them in a, in a more practical, effective way that works today. There was a lot of work done in the UK um, about consumer IoT, and I think the work is continuing, right? So they came out with a code of practice in I think, 2018, and there was a consultation in 2021. And a lot of these points came out, and I don't, I, I, don't, I think the jury is out, right? There's, there's more to think about, uh, and I think there's, there's, uh, there's probably a bit of both uh, of what you, Lorena, and Luca were saying, which is we need to push and pull. We need to encourage and spread the good practices that was we try and do. And then what we need to see, you know, we do have those product safety laws. Are we applying them to the right extent uh, when there are products that are that are defective? Um, there should be rules for consumers already. Perhaps it's what it takes is, is the sort of approach that the Council of Europe has taken in other areas where they don't automatically propose a new law, but they might provide guidance about how to reinterpret a particular legal framework in a new setting. So perhaps that, that's one thing to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. I was thinking of a new convention 108 on, the, on IoT, but <laughs> that's maybe just dreaming. <laughs> Um, well, time flies. We asked with Sami for four hours, but sadly <laughs> we could not get it. Um, we wanted to thank you for the great discussion, Raina, Luca, Jean-Jacques. Maybe uh, I was checking on the on the chat and on the QI pod if anything was flying, but that's not. We were very, I guess, very clear <laughs> on the statements. So I would like to thank you all. Give the floor to Sami for a quick word also. Thank you very much for your presence today and for the insights that you provide us from different angles, legal one, human rights, technical policy. So we had like a large uh, uh, overview of uh, this issue and uh, discussion will carry on and hope we'll meet uh, in next IGFs or other conventions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah,